Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the study this morning. Uh, before we begin, can you join us in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have here once again this morning to open your word together, to see wonderful things out of thy law, and to receive uh, conviction and power in our lives to overcome the sins that so easily beset us. And we just pray, Lord, that um, the light that you give us uh, uh, will shine from us to others. We thank you for this study that we've been doing in the book of Judges. We ask for your continued blessing that your Holy Spirit can speak to us. And we pray, Lord, that uh, each person can understand these things clearly and that they can study them out for themselves. Be with, with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Now, we have uh, spent quite a bit of time on Judges chapter 5. And what we had done, um, I guess it would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, maybe even Tuesday, or Monday, can't remember when we started looking at Judges 5, but we addressed a line, and that line is the line um, that goes from November 9th to January 11th. And we went through these symbols that we found here in Judges chapter 5, and we saw that they fell nicely into place in the line that we created. Um, and that this line uh, addresses a, a repeat of history. That is, it's going to go over the, the line of Debron Barak, which is chapter four. Uh, and when it repeats that history, it is um, uh, doing so in a way that uh, it's zooming into the final way mark, but it still covers uh, that whole line. So I'll just show you here. Okay, so this is the song of Deborah and Barak, and this is the line of Deborah and Barak. So the line of Deborah and Barak is, um, is going to be addressing this uh, Levitical chiasm, but it's going to start uh, also with part of the 777 Chiasm, that is the the third group of 777 days, the fourth being from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, and the first being for, starting with the Mayan calendar. So in this line of Deborah and Brack, uh, the darkness, of course, is dealing with the organizational darkness um, of Parminder's movement. And... Um, basically the conflict that's going to occur, but primarily these are about this, this Levitical line that demonstrates um, that Parminder's message is error, right? So it counters Parminder's message. It ties together all these symbols from Samuel Snow's letters and events in our history. And uh, it ends with November 9th, 2019, that closed door. So when we get to the song of Deborah and Barak, oops, there it is, um, it's going to address this darkness here um, on September 7th, 2019. So it's going to basically go through the history of um, the darkness of Parminder, this conflict over the institutions, right? So we can see that that's related to the organizational darkness. So Parminder created this idea of organization, which was papal. And then they're going to come into this confrontation with FFA, with Jeff particularly, over these institutions, Lambert Church. Um, Deborah, of course, is a B, and that's going to represent the School of the Prophets, North Bumblebee Road, and of course, FFA, the symbol of FFA, 
that shows up in in some of these lines are uh, 661, that is 6 is F and 1 is A. Um, so, so we have all of those things happening. And then we went through this line and showed that this line addressed um, first the understanding of the Levitical chiasm, and then also that this line was on a line of failed predictions. And November 9th, 2019 is when the 11,900 is presented to this movement in, in a clear way when we're dealing with the 273, and that's on November 9th, 2019. That message um, gets expanded upon. First, we have the Levitical chiasm on January 11th, 2020. Jeff recognizes this importance of what Daniel Fontenot presents on that day. And that Levitical chiasm that Jeff recognizes later is uh, going to be the model for the 777 chiasm that I present to Jeff on April 26, 2020 in an email, which he seems to ignore, even though he said he was going to watch the video that I'd made on it and read uh, the paper that I'd written on it, he doesn't, or read what I wrote about it, he doesn't um, ever take that into account in any of his presentations. And then, of course, the prediction itself fails. And um, so its failure then is the arrival of the second angel's message, and we saw how 510 related to that. Um, we have the symbols of the Gregorian and Julian date of July 18th. And then this movement rehearses in examining the foundations, which is what verse 11 is talking about. And that's March 7th, 2021. And then um, December 25th, 2021, we get the 777 from Stephen and we get light regarding the connections between uh, Daniel chapter 3, uh, Daniel chapter one, uh, 11, verse 1 to 4, and Revelation 17 that Colin presents, which is light, but can't be understood unless it's in the correct context. That is the light of all that we've examined since, well, at least since July 18, 2020, but even before. And we noticed that that's 1160 days from November 9th. That can represent 11-9. And of course, Stephen's birthday is going to be uh, 30 days um, after the end of January 11th to the start of his birthday, which is his 54th birthday. That's 1190 days from November 9th, 2019. And Stephen was born 11,000. 900 days prior to September 11th, 2001. So he has this 11, 9, and 9, 11 attached to his um, birthday. And then we addressed uh, this 111, 777 days, is 111 weeks. And we saw this symbol in the song of Deborah and Barak. That's why we have January 11th, 2020, and January 11th, 2023 as waymarks. And um, there's some things about the number 111, which I don't know how important they are, but one is if you take the binary number 111, that's the number seven, right? If you convert it into base 10. If you convert it into base 8, it's also number 7. It's actually number 7 and anything above base 8. Um, so that's interesting because we know if we take 111 and we put a 7 after it, we have this symbol of 1117, which we know 11 times 17 is uh, 187. We also know one, 7 times 11 is 777. So within that 1111 or 100, 111 is this symbol of 777. Uh, 
The other thing is we know that seven and six, when they come into conflict, that that's the great controversy. That's the number 13, which is rebellion. Um, if you take the number 111, just as the number 111, and you change it into, um, you can change its base. So I know not everybody understands about bases, but if you change it into base, um, uh, to base seven, it becomes the number 216. And 216 is six times six times six. So we have that number there um, connected to the number 11 by just changing it into base seven. Of course, we can see that that's another way of arranging 1117, right? 111 changed to base seven creates 216. So we start to see that this, these numbers are interlocked with each other in various ways. Some of these are less important ways than others, but they're still uh, evidences of this importance of the 111. So this is, um, you know, so this is something that relates to this January 11th date, which is what the Song of Deborah and Barak is addressing. Now we remember the Song of Deborah and Barak is a zoom into the fourth way mark. That is, it's a repeat of history, the fourth way mark on the line of Deborah and Barak. So when we put the Song of Deborah and Barak, Judges 5 here, we can see we zo we're zooming into this fourth way mark, which is January 11th, 2020, on this line. Now, the Song of Deborah and Barak is a zoom into uh, basically September 7th, 2019, but also includes October 13th, 2019. So it, it includes part of that Levitical chiasm, maybe all of it. That's why Deborah and Barak has this little, um, the Levitical chiasm in it um, and uh, we know of course the judges line itself is a zoom into um, the arrival of the second angel in our line but that arrival of the second angel in our line is a zoom into the Sunday law way mark. Now, so when we think about it in that way, we know that that's what we're doing here with the judges line. But the judges line, it's not a way mark on the big line, the big line from creation, uh, lost to creation, restored, if you want to put it that way. It's, it's not on that line. Right? That is, it's not a way mark. It is actually in that line, it's a progressive destruction of four. That is, it's between uh, way marks. It's going to be the, between uh, the way mark having to do with, um, and if I go back here, where do we have it? Um, I thought I had that whole line here somewhere. Maybe I didn't even put it in this folder. I thought I did in this document. I might not have put it in here. So that one we'd have to go to the other lines. But anyway, the point is we're not going to do that right now. Uh, just what I want to show is that we take this judge's line and we're applying it to our history. So when we're doing that, um, we're, we're taking something that comes from the Old Testament, and we were making an application of it. But that application goes from 9-11 to 2023, January 11th, 2023. And so the Book of Judges keeps illustrating our history. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do about the pointer, Ron. I, I've never figured that out. It, it's inside your settings. It's under um, uh, your mouse. It's yeah, your I, I tried I'll show that. you later. I'll show you later. I tried that, but when I go to this program, it just goes small again. 
uh, the, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. So it doesn't, it doesn't change it in this program. <clears throat> we, we tried that, remember? Uh, no, I don't. I, 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 I just know I keep having trouble seeing where you're at, you know, until you start like swinging it around. So it makes, yeah, you know, I understand. Okay. So, um, so when we're dealing with Deborah and Brack, we're, we're taking an application of history from the past and we see that it illustrates our movement. Now, what does that mean? Like, why is that? Why can we go to the book of Judges, um, take the book of Judges and say it goes from 9-11 to 2023 based on Judges 2, and then why can we look at each of these judges and why can we zoom in in this way and just keep seeing more detail about our history? Why, why is that? Ultimately, it's God's plan for us. Okay, that's, that's not kind, the kind of answer I'm looking for. Okay. I'm looking for something, something else. More, more tangible? No, it's just that's like, you know, why is the sky blue? God made it that way. That's right. <laughs> okay. I get it. Um, right. mm -hmm. so, so I've been going over chapter two here recently, okay. a little harder. And um, as I was going through it, it was only through the memories of what we had experienced that I was able to place those things because uh, I, I really didn't remember the study very well personally. Um, but when I went back to it, uh, I was able to, um, because of all the things that we have noticed and whatnot before from after that, mm -hmm. but during that time um, or during chapter two, it, uh, it became more and more relevant or apparent that it was speaking in those years uh, as you started traveling down through two, uh, going from one to two to three to four and five, and then thinking about the uh, the events that had transpired in those dates, because I've gone back and started, you know, uh, writing the dates down for the years, you know, in succession. So I, I know what has been going on or well, at least reminds me of what was going on. So I don't know if that is an answer that you're looking for, but that's well, it, that's it, what's got it's me to the answer I'm looking for. So what's that? it is the answer I'm looking for. So okay. when we we know that all of these things that happened before time happened for our learning upon whom the end of the world has come, right? So that's what we believe. World, right. But we have to pass over the ground of Fulfilled, fulfilled prophecy before we can see these things. And we can see that quite clearly. There's no way that we could have taken uh, Judges chapter 2 in, you know, at, in the year of 9-11, let's say, and said, oh, you know, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum. Uh, this is 9-11. And this is this is our history, and we can just read this and see what we're going to what's going to happen, right? We can't. No, we couldn't have done that. We actually have to pass through the history. So yeah, you know, yeah, even if, that's the way it happened, right? So, so when you pass through prophecy being fulfilled, God gives you light for your feet, and so. We could look, we could almost look anywhere in the Bible and find light for our feet. But now God led us to the book of Judges to do this because we were studying the lines and we could see these patterns and structures within the lines that they occurred in all of these stories, just as like Jeff said they did, but that they are much more detailed than we thought and that we can zoom into each way mark and see another line. But we only can do that if we are passing over that history that that line is illustrating. So, you know, people in the past could have looked at judges and seen their history in the book of judges. The Millerites could have done it and we can make applications of the book of judges to past histories, right? Because all of those histories 
are God's dealings with man. And his dealings with man are ever the same. So, so the fact that we can do this just is just the fact that we are passing through prophecy being fulfilled. And this isn't the only application that can be made of the book of Judges. It's an application that we make because we're passing through this history. But it's a solid and valid analysis of what we're experiencing. Because it's based upon the Bible. It's based upon the symbols that God has given us. And it's based upon many other lines in the past. Right? So when we look at June 9th to October 13th on this line of Deborah and Barak, and we see Samuel Snow's letters, that this is the Levitical chiasm, and that it fits into this story of Deborah and Barak, it's, it's giving us a... a uh, I don't know the word for it, but uh, it'd be like a key. And, and I can't think of, I can't think of really what the word for it would be like. Um, but, you know, you can have a, a marking key for a, a, a test, right? Where you put it over the multiple choice test and then you can see any place where the, the answer is correct. It should be uh, the pencil penciled out, right? And then you can mark how many a person got wrong or got right. Um, right. So, so this is kind of, uh, what we see here in these lines, they're, they're a key that helps us to analyze things. It's an analytical tool, right? Because we are passing, absolutely. So we are passing through fulfilled prophecy and we can understand and interpret the events that are happening to us because we have this key. Now, if we don't use the key, we can be misguided in our application of where we are on these lines. Yes. And so, so this is one of the main things that I think we've come to understand since July 18, is we've understood the lines in the past better, what we were going through. But we can also see where we are and have an idea of where we're going. And so we can see when other people are misusing the lines, that is, in, in some cases, not really even using the lines, they're just using dates and events and symbols. We can see that they, they're they misapplying the significance of those dates, events, and symbols. And you can't say that you're using Millerite history if you don't take all of those dates, if you can't analyze them on a line, just because you can find spans of time and they have symbolic numbers there, those can be correct. But it doesn't mean that your understanding of that line is correct. And we need to be sure about what these lines mean. Right. So that's why I think, you know, we can, we can look at these lines in the way that we do. Now, um, I don't know if there was anything that we had to finish up. I know uh, Dwight saw, thought there were some things that we needed to finish up in regard to um, the song of Deborah and Barak. Um, just that we have things at the end, which we hadn't. But we sort of started at the end. I mean, we did go through this, and then we worked our way from the beginning towards that point. Um, uh, the rehearsal, you know, 5-11, March 7th, 2021, that's when we start the study examining the foundations. And December 25th, 2021, we can see that that's the second angel empowered. And then there's this year span, and this year span comes... Uh, it, it's going to be a, a deficient embolismic year, so it's 383 days. Um, but this, but it's 365 plus 18, and um, and then we can see that if we take 777 times 30, or 777 times 29.530587, we get a difference of 365. And so the 777 structure has this two different ways of looking at it. Um, so we can have 
this um, 777 days uh, in, in a sense in a long span of time. So this 111 weeks uh, plus a symbol of an extension that goes to January 11th, 2023. <clears throat> so is there anything else on this line that we need to address that we forgot? that we add to this diagram or I mean, I could just simply put, you know, here, uh, this is a deficient deficient embolism. That might be helpful for some people to remember. <clears throat> Anything else before we move to Judges 514? That's a little busy, but it's, uh, it's very yeah. helpful, all the busyness is. Okay. Yeah, it's busy, but it's helpful. Okay. Yes. So we just, we just wanted to put things onto that chart so that we can see them. Now we have Judges uh, 5, verse 14 to 31. And um, we're going to start looking at that passage. Um, out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. After the Benjamin among thy people, out of Maker came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar also in Barak, and he was sent on foot into the valley, for the divisions of Reuben there were great Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Um, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in the breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized, jeopardied, jeopard, jeoparded? their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. And the kings came and fought then, fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh. By the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. They fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the ho horse hooves broken by the means of pr the prancings, the prancings of the mighty ones. Curse ye Moroz, or Morotz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly, uh, which is a doubly, the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And the hammer she smote, and with the hammer she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down at her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out at the window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? His wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors, of needlework, of diverse colors, of needlework on both sides? 
meat for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might and the land had rest 40 years. So we've gone through this before, um, Judges chapter five, right? So we, we've read through this. We've looked at some of the symbols. Now, um, what do we do with this? What do we do with this section? I mean, I'm saying that it's it's a line. So if it's a line, um, normally we have a period of darkness that's going to be mentioned. Right. At but, the beginning. Right. But, but this isn't going to give us specifically anything that tells us about a period of darkness. We're just going to jump into 14. And it's going to be describing the the nations that are going to be fighting, like the, the children of Israel, that are going to be fighting against Sisera. And it, it names names that aren't actually in the story itself. So we have to try to address why that is and uh, why, why they're mentioned when they're, they're in the song, but not in the account. So we know that all of those things are going to be symbols to us. I mean, because mm -hmm. all those... Ishkar's got a symbol. Um, Barak has a symbol. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. So that's what we're, that's what we need to start with is just deciphering the symbols. Okay. So we need to decipher the symbols. And we know that these are names of the tribes of Israel for the most part, right? Um, right. You have some other names in there. Um. And uh, just trying to find something here. So, uh, hmm. now Ephraim. So, so when we look at this story, okay, let's let, let's try to list off all of these names. We have Ephraim. Right, that's one of the tribes. Benjamin, Zebulun. Now it mentions Maker. Who's Maker or Mac here? What is Mac here? If we it look actually says salesman. <laughs> uh, that's what the forty-three fifty-three uh, says. It's a salesman. Okay. But what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. But if we take this according to the rule of first mention. Makir is one of the grandsons of Joseph. And we find that in Genesis 50 23. Yeah. yeah. So Genesis 50 23 is going to, uh, at the death of Joseph. Right. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived an hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. So that's the third generation then, Machir. Yeah, well, Joseph, um, Manasseh, and then Machir, right? Yeah, so that's his his grandson. And um, now why he's called sold, I don't know. Um, but that's that's what his name means. I don't think it mean, means salesman. I mean, it can be salesman. It's from the word salesman. Uh, but... Uh, Maybe Makir is sold and, and salesman is this word. I don't know. So, yeah, there, the BD, the BD to look at the definition BD. is sold. That's that Brown Drivers Briggs. Yeah, but that doesn't tell you the form of the word. No. Right, because 
Because you're just looking up the Hebrew number. Yeah, I'm just looking up the Hebrew numbers. That's all I'm doing. And here it's just Makir. It's not in any sort of... Uh, uh, so that is what is there. And I'd have to look it up in another form. So if we're looking at this, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin right. are all of the sons of Raquel. Okay. And then is Zebulun the last of the sons of Leah? Um, I'll tell you in a second here. Um, yep. So is this repeating the sons of Israel in reverse order? That's what it looks like it's doing. Um, yeah, here, so let's get back here. So they're going to start, of course, with Joseph. Ephraim, Manasseh, right? Um, well, <clears throat> we're we're seeing the doubling, you know, Ephraim, Manasseh, and then we have have this with Benjamin as well. So all of this being Raquel's children, and then we come to this with Zebulun, and this is in the fifth stanza of this song. All of this is the fifth stanza you're saying. Well, I'm <clears throat> from verse 14 to 18 is the fifth stanza. Okay. So, so we've got Ephraim, Benjamin, Mecher is Manasseh. Right. So it doesn't mention Manasseh. And then you got Zebulun. So the last son of Leah. Right. And so in the alternate reading, it would be out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that draw with the pen of the writer. Yeah, which there's a bunch of symbolism in here, especially when you look at the Hebrew. Right. Okay, and then so so Issachar is the next one, right? So if we're going backwards, Benjamin Joseph, which is of course um, uh, Joseph is he has Manasseh and Ephraim, and then you have Zebulun, and then you have Issachar. Now it's going to mention Zebulun again later, but uh, but then it's going to go to Reuben. Right. So it's going to go to the eldest. And but then, at, this, at, at this point, weren't Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, Zebulun, weren't those along with Issachar, weren't those the ones that joined in this battle and then the rest of them did not? Right. So now the rest didn't. But they're going to mention... Uh, I'm just trying to see which ones they don't mention. They see, they don't mention Judah, I don't think. Just looking here. Because I looked at the list before, and they don't mention Levi. Or Simeon, maybe. I'm just trying to look through this quickly. Um, so there's some that aren't mentioned. Right. Um, Dan's mentioned. Asher's mentioned, Reuben's mentioned. Um, right. So Judah and Levi were not mentioned. So that's three and four. Sons number three and number four that are not mentioned, correct? Well, and Simeon. Uh, Simeon's not mentioned. So two, three, and four. All right. So only the first and the last, um, the last two sons of of Leah are mentioned. 
And Gad isn't mentioned. I don't see Gad. Okay. Um, but Asher is. So they, they have the last son of, of Zilpah, because Gad is of Zilpah. And then uh, they mention both Dan and Naphtali. So both of Bilhas are mentioned. So why that is, I don't know. Uh, so that means we don't have Simeon, Levi, Judah, or Gad mentioned. So that's four of the 12. Sons not mentioned. Of course, Levi's not reckoned among the tribes. Um, so, I mean, there's 12 tribes. Technically, there's 13. So if you take away the four, you end up with, um, you get nine of them mentioned, I guess. Now, it's interesting because we have this in Judges 5.17. It mentions Gilead. And yet Gilead was a son of Makir. Yeah, so that's right, which is, um, and I think that's why Makir is mentioned here. Yeah, so there's there's eight of the sons mentioned specifically, I guess, with but Joseph is two, right? So he has Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, so anyway, that's that's dealing with the names. And, and Anything else that we should look at first? Is it the names that are important or is it the symbols of the sons that are, that's important here? Well, it's, it's the symbols, right? I mean, the names themselves are, are going to have symbols attached to them. Right, so we're going to have um, double fruit for Ephraim, right? Isn't that what it said? Um, yeah, but it, when it, yeah, well, that might be important, the meanings of their names. But I'm thinking like the numbering of their names of the tribes, the Hebrew numbers themselves. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, and then their history, of course is other things that are going to be right be addressed so when you're when you're speaking of in that nature are you talking like um the uh gematria uh numbering that yeah, so we got yeah so we got the gematria both english and hebrew we have the hebrew strong's hebrew numbers attached to those names that we could look at. Okay. So we just go through a systematic and, examination of each right. one. And then of course the numbering of the tribes themselves in in Joshua. Right. I mean the numbers, yeah, that they had when they made the cross or before the crossing or after the crossing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the first time they're numbered and the last time they're numbered. So all of those those things can be applied here as symbols to understand where we place them on a line. So, you know, this this, though, is going to start. Because uh, we're saying this is a line. I mean, we're just saying it is. We haven't drawn it out yet. We haven't looked at it yet. Um, uh, but we're saying that just like we have with the, the song of Deborah and Brack we, is the fourth way mark in the line of Deborah and Brack. We're saying that this part is the fourth way mark in the, the line of the song of Deborah. And Brack, right. That is, we just said that it is. 
Now, maybe it's it's different in what this line is or what it represents. Maybe there's so one of the things we put in the Song of Deborah and Barak, we put this way mark there, the fourth, and we said it's the close of probation. And it's chapter five, verse 14 to 31. So that's that's what we said. Whether that's correct or not, we don't know, but that's what we're, that's what we're was doing. proposed. That's what was proposed. All right. And instead of me working it all out and showing you what I found out, we're doing this together. Right. That's how we're doing it. So we're looking at it. We might have looked at it on our own. Obviously, I have some ideas of what this might mean, but sometimes when I come with the ideas of what I think, we end up going in a totally different direction. We find, you know, what God is leading us to. So the one thing we don't have is we don't have a defined period of darkness in those verses, other than the history that precedes it. Now, um, if we look at a line any line, we know that we have a falling away that occurs at an end of a line. That is, you have a disappointment, then you have a falling away, and then you're going to have a, what we often call a failed reform line. That is, the fourth is, is going to be the first generation in, in every other line. Um, the first generation, and it's going to uh, have a failed reform line, but then after four generations, you're going to have a major reform line. So in Millerite history, you have the third angel's message arrives, October 22, 1844. And then you have that immediate history of a reform line, which is the development of the Seventh-day Adventist church in that first generation from 1844 to 1888. And in that history, the first, second, and third angels' messages are going to be rejected. But what happens in, in that history typifies our time because we are the, in the period of the fourth angel arriving, right? That is, that, that history right after reform line is a, a, a typical history. Now, A.T. Jones is a part of that. Right, he's going to be there. And, and then we can zoom into A.T. Jones' history, 1888. And when you zoom into 1888, uh, the General Conference uh, bulletin articles that we're looking at, they're actually addressing that history. And he's paralleling this history. This is the Friday night studies where the mighty angel of Revelation came, 8 came down. Revelation 18 came down. That's what Jones says, that they're in the Sunday law and the, mar the period of the mark of the beast. And all those things that we said about our line, Jones is in that. But his history is typifying our history. Now, when I say our history, our history is the history of the Sunday law. But within the history of the Sunday law, we have this movement that has a history. And that's what we're studying. We're studying the history of this movement and its role and its place in Bible prophecy so that we can know what our history means, why our movement was raised up, and, and what our responsibility is, and, and when, what we're going to do about that. So those are the things that, that we're studying here in looking at this. Now, I'm saying that this is a close of probation. That is, it's typifying the close of probation. It's not the close of probation. That is, we're not saying that we're, we've, we're looking at the way mark that is the close of probation on the big line. That's not what we say that we're studying here in Judges 5, verse 14 to 31. We're studying a close of probation in this line. Now, we have a close of probation at way mark number seven. Why am I putting a close of probation at way mark? Uh, for AA, waymark number eight. Why would I do that if we already had the close of probation in waymark seven?
Am, am I wrong in doing that? I don't think you're wrong in that because we're talking about a different line at this point. We're looking at a, a zoom in too, right? Okay. So think about Ellen White's line. Look at this line as the song of Deborah and Brack and imagine that's Millerite history. And we have uh, the third angel arrive October 22nd, 1844. And Ellen White sees the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming in this history connected with the close of probation, right? The Sunday law history. Right. Okay. So that's the parallel that I'm making. I'm saying that you have a close of probation, October 22, 1844. But that close of probation isn't the close, close of probation for the end of the world. It's the close of probation for those who had rejected of the second angel's message that time frame right they come to their disappointment they show their characters now you're going to have this new movement but ellen white sees the sunday law and the sunday law revelation 18 is addressing the close of probation for the world not necessarily the first few verses but it is if you read through revelation 18 it's the story of the end of the world the Sunday law and its aftermath. Now, um, just a, a, a thought that's just a bit of an aside of that. You know, in, in the book of Revelation, we have Revelation, uh, what's Revelation 16? The seven last plague. Yes, the seven last plague. The threefold, <laughs> threefold union. Right. So the seven last plagues come after the close of probation. So, so why do we have Revelation 18 as the Sunday law if you know, the plagues are already mentioned in 17? And 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 then or 16. And then we have 17. We have again. Uh, can we, can we see that in the book of Revelation, this idea of repeat and enlarge is really just the fact that we're looking at different lines at different times, illustrating the same history? Yeah, that is more than probable. Yeah, and, and that we've never really understood that. I mean, we sort of on, on one level understood that it's a repeat of history. But Would you call it a reiteration? Well, I repeat and enlarge, yeah. Right, each of these stories in, repeats upon the previous one different details, but leads to the same end. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. And and so it's it's progressing. The lines progress, and when you have a line, each line overlaps the other one that is there. One is a zoom into some particular aspect uh, of something. So, so we know we, we, in a sense, have a close of probation, chapter 16, but we have a close of probation, chapter 17. We have a close of probation, chapter 18, right? We keep having these close of probations, um, and even before that, right? So, so we have these, these things that, are, that repeat themselves, in the book of Revelation. You can put Revelation 7 and 14 together, both talking about the 144,000. Now, I'm saying here that in Judges uh, chapter 5, verse 14 to 31, that this, this is about the close of probation, but a close of probation within this movement that's typical of the close of probation at the end of the world. And one is you're going to have these tribes, the 144,000, being mentioned, right? It's not going to mention all of them, right? It's going to be a different list than you see in Revelation 7. I mean, so we need to understand why that is, why it's illustrating it in this way. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we know we have to look at all of these names. We have to try to figure, figure out what those names mean symbolically in all the different ways that we can examine names. <clears throat> um, now, we also have to look at all the words, right, and see the symbols that are there and, and apply them in... As just as we've been doing in the book of Judges. So let's look at verse 15, for instance. So we're going to start here. So we have Ephraim. Ephraim is, uh, you know, we, it's the double portion, basically, is what his name is referring to. That's why the double fruit. Um, uh, the word there, it's plural, is what we call the dual plural. Ain, right? Um, and then we have uh, uh, it says double ash heap as well. I shall be doubly fruitful. Uh, we know that he's the second son of Joseph, uh, but he's given preference over Manasseh. Um, now the word that it comes from Ephrath, fruitfulness. Uh, we know Bethlehem is also called Bethlehem Ephratah, but that's just because it's Bethlehem uh, connected with Ephraim. Okay, and then we got, uh, that's just putting it in the gematria. Yes, uh, sir. So you put uh, Ephraim as the English word, I would assume, because that's all he has. Yes, sir. Uh, I took it straight out of, of uh, chapter five. Right. Okay, and so the significance here, you have uh, uh, lots of different things. So when you put things in the, the palmoni.org gematria calculator, you can see you have just the sum of those letters is 70. Um, and then they multiply them. You get a product, 1347840. And then you get a reverse sum. The reverse sum is interesting because it's 119. Okay. That was an interesting one. That caught my yeah. eye. 70 and 1119 both caught my eye. And then you have a reverse product, which is a really large number. And then you have a combined, that is, if you take 70 plus um, 119, you get 189, which reminds us of 1989. Right? And then you can also subtract them. You get a differential, which is 49, which is 7 times 7. Right. And of course, that can be a bit of a shorthand for the 777 structure of a line. Right. So it looks to me, just based upon the name Ephraim, that we're tied to um, November 9th, 2019, September 11th as well, and also to the 11 9 in 1989. So we're, we're tied to this structure. It's just symbols of the structure of our lines. That's basically what we would say that the name Ephraim has. Now, in, in Hebrew, it's Aleph. Um, uh, <coughs> you got all these letters. Um, can't think of the name of that letter. Resh, uh, Yod, and Mem. I always just look at the letter. So... So I'm going to take this and put this in a, a gematria calculator that uses Hebrew. Um, Where's that you. tool? Uh, Gematrix. <laughs> okay. Gematrix.org. Gematrix.org. Okay. Yeah. And, and all that does gives you the Hebrew gematria. So just the Hebrew uh, letters, what they're worth, Aleph. Um, it's worth one. What's the letter there? Peh. 80, Resh, 200, Yod is 10, and uh, Mem is 40, right? So you add it together, you get uh, 331. So it doesn't do the, the multiplication, but I can easily do that. Um, and that's simply 8 times 2 times 4. 
which gives me the number 64. So, and it doesn't give me a reverse or anything like that. So, so we're not seeing too much there, eh? No, no, not really. I mean, I see 331, and that could be a date like March 31st, but I don't have anything for that. Just could be 13, March 13th, or the 13th day of the third month. Right. So, um, you know, so I don't know. Right. But we look at it. I mean, so we look at all these different uh, symbols. It's a process of elimination. You know, you have to, it, you have to go through it systematically and able to eliminate stuff or yeah. uh, advance certain things. Yeah. So anyway, we look at Ephraim and we have symbols with Ephraim. Um, now it says out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. So this is Amalek is the Amalekites. Now, who is the enemy in this story? The story of, of Sisera. He has to do with the king of the Canaanites with Eglon, right? So, um, but, so when it's talking about uh, out of Ephraim, there was a root of them. What's that? With 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 uh, Jabin. Jabin is that a yeah, Jabin? Barak and Deborah. Yeah, Jabin. Okay, I, I I thought the name wasn't right. So Jabin, king of Canaan. That's right. Okay, thanks for correcting me there. Okay, so we have Jabin, king of Canaan, uh, Canaan, and and that's that's the the enemy that that they're attacking. Um, but in here it's going to talk about Amalek. So what is this story of Ephraim uh, and Amalek? Why is this mentioned? What is this referencing? Now, here is just a modern translation of this verse from Ephraim, their root. They march down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Maker, march down the commanders, and from Zebulun, those that bear the lieutenant's staff. So, it's a, you know, it's a bit of an interpretation to some degree. Uh, another translation says troops came from Ephraim, where the, where Amalekites once lived, others came from Benjamin, officers and leaders came from Makir and Zebulun. Um, and the Young's literal translation, out of Ephraim, their root is against Amalek. After the Benjamin, among thy peoples, out of Makir came down lawgivers, and out of Zebulun, those drawing with the reed of a writer. So we're going to get quite... Uh, could Amalek refer to Dan backbiting, attacking the weak? So that's when. Um... Okay, can you expand on that more? What you mean, how that would refer to Ephraim? No, I just saw that might 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 be referring to the backbiting and and the gossip that that's rampant in the group. Okay, maybe. Now, so Amalek means dweller in the valley, right? So that's why the one of the translations says they went out down into the valley. Instead of using the word name Amalek as a name, they just used it as the dwellers of the valley. Okay, and when it comes to Amalek, as far as, uh, I mean, it shows up in the Bible, lots of different places. Uh, it's first mentioned in Genesis 
36.12, it's in the Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and mentioned here in Judges. Right. Now, now the other thing about Amalek, because I'm going to say that this is referring to Amalek, not just the dwellers in the valley. Um, but the question is, why are they going to mention Amalek in this context when we're talking about Sisera and uh, Jabin, king of Canaan? So we have Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Zebulun. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. So we don't even know what that means yet. So remember, this is a song, and it's recounting some history. And it has to mean something. So I'm going through, uh, I did a search on Ephraim and Amalek combined. Yeah. Uh, and I came up with Judges 514, which is what we're studying, yeah. and also Judges 1215. So in 1215. That's um, abandon the son of Hill, 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 the Pirithonite, died and was buried in Pirithon in the land of Ephraim in the Mount of the Amalekites. So, so the Mount of the Mal Amalekites is in Ephraim. So why is that? Hmm. Well, Evidently, Ephraim displaced the Amalekites. Yes, right. So, when did they do that? If we go back, um, I did another <laughs> search again for Amalekite uh, or Amalek, and uh, I popped up with the several hits and. This is the this is the guy that Moses stood on top of the mount with his hands raised up, right? When they when they fought them. Uh, who's the guy? Amalek. They Amalek fighting, was the, oh, they were they fighting were, against the Amalekites. That's what you're saying. Well, uh, I did I did a, a search on Amalek. Yeah, and it comes up with a bunch of stuff. And but the, one of the things that I noticed was that it looks like uh, uh, Moses stood on top of a mountain and held his they held his arms up while they battled. Right. So this is Exodus chapter seventeen. Right. Okay. So this first you're going to have this water from the rock, and then you have Israel defeats Amalek. Then there came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So, uh, right, so this is one of their, their places in their wilderness wanderings. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out of men and go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And so Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mount. It came to pass when Moses had held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Right. So. Um, so this brings us to this battle. How does this relate then to what we're looking at in Judges? Dealing with Amalek. So Amalek is this continual enemy, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And we know in the story of Judges that we keep running into Ephraim. And what is Ephraim in the story of Judges? Um, the tribe who complained they hadn't been called to battle when they were right so so they're they're always going to be complaining now it says out of ephraim there was a root of them against amalek now um so the word root can mean bottom deep heel root it's from eight three to seven Sharash and it's mentioned in Job and in Psalms and Isaiah that that word itself the root one when we look at 8328 it's also translated root um, So it can, it says here, lest there should be among man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. So that's Deuteronomy 29, 18. The next time is Judges 5, 14. Right, that word root is used. So, um, so when it talks here, out of Ephraim there was a root. Could this be a root of bitterness? But it says it's against Amalek. Now, um, I'm just going to look at the Hebrew here. Now, I don't know why they say against, because that's not what it says in Hebrew. It says in Amalek. But Amalek, it has a bet at the beginning. <clears throat> so would this not say rather um that there's this root of bitterness in Ephraim that is the same root of bitterness in Amalek. I mean, I see why they're translating it this way, because they're looking at this as the story of of this battle, so um, you know, Ephraim's not particularly involved. Right? So I mean, in this battle in chapter four, we have um, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, right? They're going to be the ones that that join with them. And then you're going to have, um, let me see, is there any other? Yeah, so we don't even have anyone else mentioned, right? Other than uh, Barak is from which tribe? 
which which tribe are these? We know that Deborah dwells between Rama and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, um, but she's going to call Barak out of Kadesh Naphtali, city of Naphtali. And you're going to have Naphtali in Zebulun. So, so what is this about Ephraim in verse 15? Or verse 14, I mean. So it says, literally, from Ephraim, a root um, in Amalek. That's why they put of them against Amalek, but against is not in the Hebrew, just of Amalek. Yeah, um, kind of sounds the way you put it like that. It sounds like it might be saying just that, that it's comparing Ephraim to Amalek. Right. And as being now, basically the same character. Yeah, of the same character. Now we have this word after. So after the Benjamin. Uh Hosea 9, verse 6, Ephraim is smitten, their root is dried up. Okay, so Hosea 9, 16, is that, was it, 9, 16? So that's a root connected to Ephraim. Um, and then I'm just, I need to look at the Hebrew, so. Um, after the. After the, after them in Benjamin, um, it's my people. Okay. Out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. After the Benjamin among thy people, out of Machir came down governors. Now we know governors uh, refers to scribes who write on metal tablets. <clears throat> so that's Manasseh. And out of Zebulun, they that handle the pet pen of the writer. Okay, let's hang on a sec here. I'll be I'll be right back. You guys can Yeah, nobody said anything. So what do we do with these things? So we have this, this root out of Ephraim. We have Benjamin, the son of the right hand, who's among the people or in the people. And then we have Makir. He's going to come down. And this word governors, to be ascribed by implication to an act, uh, laws being cut in stone or metal tablets in primitive times. But we can connect this to the writing out of the lines, right? And out of Zebulun, habitation, son of Jacob, also his territory and tribe. Uh, so it means a habitation. 
they that handle the pen of the writer. So, so you have writing on, on metal tablets. So how do we how do we address this? We're going to say that this is on a line. We've got one verse. We hardly understand what it means. We just have these symbols. Now, if we we look at um, these different tribes, so we could look up Amalek as a name. Now, did we have anything just the basic gematria on this verse? We didn't complete it. We just got like Ephraim and that was it. Yeah. Okay. We just did Ephraim. Um, Aran, do you got any information on this verse that's interesting? some stuff in the chat dealing with Issachar and Jeremiah. What does, does it say metal tablets? What does it say that? Okay, so governors, that, that word governors is, is has to do with um, uh, says a primitive root, it's a kakak, properly to hack, that is engrave, to be a scribe, Simply, by implication to an act, laws being cut in stone or metal tablets in primitive times, or generally prescribed, appoint, decree, governor, grave, lawgiver, note, portray, print, set. So whatever we can say about this is that we have these groups of people at this time on this line, you have some that there was a root uh, in Amalek, and then you have the son of the right hand. So after the son of the right hand among the people. And then from Makir, right? So Makir is sold. Ephraim and Amalek both have a reverse sum of 11.9. Okay, so that's interesting, right? So both these words, Ephraim and Amalek, have this 11.9. Now, so can we put this at 11.9 where we have this division that occurs in the movement? But we also have these things written on a line, right? That is, we have uh, Makir came, came down governors, right? So we're going to say that this is the line. This is dealing with the 2520 structures. Psalm 45, 1, the tongue, teaching, legislating, uh, comparing, um, compared to a pen of a ready writer. Psalm 45 is also a victory song, right? So we can see that we've, we, we've taken this history and we've placed it on a line. Now, now Zebulun, we say um, out of Zebulun. So, what, what did we have with Zebulun? That they that handle the pen of a ready uh, or the pen of a writer. Because we've already tr addressed Zebulun. Zebulun is going to be this period of time, the, the number of days. What is it? 57,400 days from the organization of the Adventist Church. In 1863 to July 18, 2020. So, do we have at nine at 11 9 on November 9, 2019? Do we have um, a line pointing to July 18? We do, right? With Zebulun. Right. Okay. 15,000 some days, wasn't it? 57,400 days, I believe. 57,000, that was it. Yeah. yeah. So that's the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun. 
And that goes from May 23rd, 1863 to July 18, 2020. Okay, so, so we're taking our time here, but uh, we have that with Amalek. What about Makir? What does his name yield in Gematria and Zebulun himself? Here, reverse sums 100 110, normal sums 52, combined 162, differential 58, and Zebulon. Um, the reverse sum is 88. Combined is 189. Normal sum is 101. And the differential is 13, whatever that means. But so far, we've been looking at the reverse sums. So if we take the reverse sums as being 11.9, 88, what's the significance of 88 in our lines and symbols? Like, how are we using it? So Jeff used 88, two eights, the number eight. So that was... Uh... The days for the divorcement, was it? Eight, eight. Well, okay. Yeah. So it was the number of days from uh, the first day of the 10th month. To That's the, right. To the, the first fourth. Month. Right. First day of the fourth month. Which is interesting because the normal sum there is 101, which can represent the first day of the 10th month, the 10th day, the first month. Um. It also can represent the first day of the first month. And then the reverse sum is 88, the number of days from, from the first day of the first month to the first day of the 10th, or the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. So yeah, so we can see that these symbols here are relating to, um, to our lines, but, but we should be able to place Judges 15, 14 and probably we will see that we can take verse 15 and put all of those at uh, 11.9, right? So, so that's what, what I believe that we will find when we start going through these, uh, these lines. So we're almost out of time here. So we're going to see that there's there's all these symbols in these that that help us place it on a line. Yeah. So the eight days that has to do with Second Chronicles twenty nine. <clears throat> and now the other thing, just before we finish, is Issachar. Um, Issachar is a um, three hundred three four five eight in the Hebrew, or it's three four what three four eight five? Is that what it is? I think we'll come to these numbers here later. We'll start to see the significance of these numbers. We already looked at Barak's name, and Deborah's name, but we got Issachar's name as well. Okay. Uh, Let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time here this morning. We know that we're moving very slowly, uh, but we ask, Lord, that you can help us in our personal study to look at these things and help us to understand them. Uh, be with us throughout this day. We ask for your angels to watch over us 
and um, that you can bring us together to study your word according to thy will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.